Wherever one person of the Trinity is, there the other two must be. Must be, because of this strict unity of God. Now, as an analogy, now remember that we're talking about God here. In theology, the object of study is God. Uh, theology concerns the study of God and all things as they relate to God. So, revelation, divine revelation. God is revealing himself to us, the one God. We have three elements, inextricably united, compenetrated. Scripture, tradition, magisterial teaching. No one of those can exist without the other two. Now, this is important. Is God, is your concept of God correct if it isn't one God, three divine persons? No, that's what it is. That's a fact. That's objective reality. But you could say, well, yes, but I don't believe that. Well, fine. You believe anything you want, but your belief will be out of accord with truth unless you believe that because that's a fact. Oh, yes, but there are many religions. Indeed, there are, and they're not all right. Okay, I respect them all, but they are not all correct. The objective truth is that there is one God, and that one God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That one God has revealed himself to us. Sacred tradition, sacred scripture, magisterial teaching. If, you're, if, God is, if you say God's only the Holy Spirit, can the Holy Spirit really be the Holy Spirit without the Father and the Son? No. No. You say only scripture. Can that be true? No. No. No one of those can subsist without the other two. It's a Trinitarian analogy. Tradition, scripture, magisterial teaching, no one of which can subsist without the other two. You say, oh, but scripture is all I want. Scripture is all I have. Okay, if that's all you have, you don't have scripture. You can't. You can't have scripture because no one of those can subsist without the other two. Well, well how, how can that be? Listen, there's three principles. Three principles for understanding God's revelation, okay? Reading the Bible. Okay, here's a Bible. Now this Bible has a lot of words in it, right? All these words are synthesized, condensed, and distilled into one word. All this equals Jesus. All this equals Jesus Christ. That's the truth. He is the truth. Yeah, but who is Jesus? You might say, who recognizes the face of Christ? Peter recognized Christ for who he was. The successors of Peter, the Pope. So the magisterium of the church recognizes and teaches the authentic and authoritative word of God. When I read the Bible, I have to read it with three principles operational. Otherwise, I can't truly read it authentically and authoritatively. The word of God must be read as a totality. In other words, when you read the Bible, you cannot take things out of context. Otherwise, you can justify everything, including murder. Oh, yeah. Oh, we, we had it when I was down in Florida. There was, a, there was a, a, a minister down there who was justifying killing abortion doctors because it protected the innocent and, and used the Bible or tried to use the Bible to justify that. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, you know, and you take an innocent life and your life will be taken. No, you can't take it out of context. You must read the Bible as a totality. That's the first principle. The second principle, you must read the written word of God in light of sacred tradition. If you don't have sacred tradition, if you don't know what it is or use it, how are you going to read the Bible in the light of that sacred tradition? You're not. You're going to make errors in your interpretation. And three, you must read the, word, the written word of God, the Bible, you must read it applying the analogy of the faith. You say, what's that? The analogy of the faith. It's very simple. It's the body of doctrine 
which the faith has been given. The teaching of the church in faith and moral. Okay, let's say uh, somebody takes the Bible and they, they say, well, Jesus in the Bible uh, is inclusive. He, he loves everybody. He does. Absolutely. And therefore, uh, it's okay to live a homosexual lifestyle. And they'll use the Bible to justify that. Wrong, wrong, wrong. They're reading the written word of God, not in the light of sacred tradition, and they're not applying the analogy of the faith, and they arrive at erroneous, fallacious conclusions. You can't do it. And they go, oh, you're bigoted. Nope, not bigoted. You're homophobic. Nope, not homophobic. Man, I've had a million conversations with homosexual persons. I love them. They are the children of God. And I'm not afraid of them. I tell them this. You and I are very much alike. And they say, oh. <laughs> no. No. You and I are very much alike because we're both called to celibacy. Now stop and think for a moment. Listen to what I just said. We're very much, I sympathize with your struggles. You're a child of God and God loves you. No question about that. And I've got to love you too. If God loves you, I've got to love you. I'm no better than God. Servant's no better than his master. Jesus loves them. And I have to love them. And you have to love them. But love is not confirming someone in their sins. Taking the easy way out. Patting them on the head and saying, you're okay, I'm okay. No, there's something wrong. Something very wrong. This political correctness is the kiss of death to human dignity. And it's got to stop.